2 Peter, the second chapter, verses 1 through 3 today. The King James text reads in this fashion. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Amen. Talking to us today on the topic, we shouldn't be surprised You'll just bow your heads with me one more moment. Father, once again, God, at this point in the service, we turn to the Word of the Lord. And Lord, I acknowledge today that I am weak in body. I am frail. I haven't the ability to be a blessing or a help or an encouragement to the people of God. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Master, right now, God, reach out and touch the ear of every hearer. Prepare our heart, O oh God, to receive from your word. And Lord, when this service is over, we'll know we've not merely heard from men, we've heard from the Lord. Master, in the name of Jesus, touch my feeble lips of clay, and allow me, O oh God, today to deliver your word faithfully, in a manner that will bring glory and honor to your name. We ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. Tommy and I were driving the other day somewhere and we passed a church and I told him, I said, you know, I hate to even confess this. But these days, Johnny, when I pass churches and I look at that building, I, I feel a certain amount of contempt in me. Isn't that awful? Do you know what I'm talking about? There used to be a time when I passed church houses and I would think, well, bless the Lord, that's where people gather to worship. They may not believe exactly the way I do. They may not understand exactly the way I understand it. But, you know, and I, there was a certain good feeling, you know, that there were people who loved the Lord and who were serving the Lord to the best of their ability. And, and that building represented you know, a place where people came together in the love of God and, and desiring a deeper knowledge of God. Well, I got news for you. I don't look at church houses the same way anymore. It's funny, but the campaign of 2015, the election of 2016, kind of threw that all out the window. All of a sudden now, I look at churches and I, I feel this terrible, awful sense of almost contempt. You know, just, I know what so many of these people are thinking and feeling based on the actions that have been taken by so many in recent months and years. And I don't know, it's a terrible thing when you're a Christian and somebody says to you, well, I'm a Christian. And you don't feel good about hearing that either, do you? Because you don't know half these people call themselves Christian. You don't know what kind of crazy fool ideas they've got in their head. Calling themselves Christians and yet they can be supportive of some of the most evil people on this planet. They can be supportive of some of the most 
devilish, ungodly, heathenistic policies that we have ever seen put in place by a government in the history of our country. A lot of people want to believe the Word of God is just some old ancient document, you know. This is just an old book written by a bunch of old men. I always have to laugh when people come at me with that argument, you know. Oh, it's just a book. It just was written by men. Um, yeah, it is a compilation of books written by numbers of men over the course of thousands of years. This book is a whole lot more than you, than you might give it credit for. If you think uh, this is not the Book of Mormon, let me tell you a little secret. Every document that Mormons use for their doctrine and for their belief system, every book they use was penned by one singular man, Joseph Smith. They say, oh, he's our great prophet. Well, that's funny because you know what the Word of God said? The Word of God said, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. God never uses one person to do all his talking. That's why we have Isaiah. That's why we have Ezekiel. That's why we have Jeremiah. That's why we have Hosea. That's why we have Amos. That's why we have Malachi and Micah. We have all these different prophets in the Old Testament. That's why we have Matthew. That's why we have Mark. That's why we have Luke. And that's why we have John. Because God doesn't use one single person to convey his truth. No, he said, I will confirm everything I say out of the mouth of two or three. But according to Mormonism, everything you need to know come out of one man's mouth, one man's hand. By Mr. Joseph Smith. Well, it's all well and good. It justifies the uh, teachings and principles of the Word of God. But I'm going to tell you something about this book that's, that's amazing. We're living in one of the most difficult times the world will ever see right now. And this book told us it was coming. We are seeing things happen in the church world today that nobody could have possibly anticipated or expected. Johnny, I've seen family members and friends that I knew for many years that I had a, an enormous amount of confidence in. And I saw them during the campaign of 2015 fall after Mr. Trump and fall right into that pack like a bunch of blind sheep. And I would have never in a million years dreamed they would have done that. I would have never in a million years imagined that they could be so blind and so ignorant and so foolish that they could be talked into following after a man whose character and morality is beyond questionable, there is no question. <laughs> it's well established. There is no question as to uh, this man's Christianity. Well, I'll tell you something, honey. Don't you dare stand there and tell me that that, that man, and I'm not preaching politics today. You'll understand what I'm getting at in a minute. But don't you dare tell me that man is a Christian. Don't you dare stand there and tell me that. That is the biggest crock of crap I've ever heard in my life. Don't give me this. Well, he's a newbie. He's a new Christian. That's why he doesn't just act altogether right. Let me tell you something. You watch one of his rallies and see him stirring his crowds up into a frenzy until they're about ready to go out in the street and start killing people. You watch him stir people up till they start punching each other in the face in the middle of his 
political rallies. We've never seen this in the history of our country. You watch that foolishness and tell me that's a Christian standing at the microphone. No, that's not a Christian. The Word of God said if you can't tame your tongue, then your religion is vain. Well, that pretty much solves it right there, doesn't it? That pretty much clears it up right there. If you can't control this thing, then, honey, your religion don't amount to a hill of beans. I watched some video the other night of some of the rallies that this guy's conducted, and I was watching some of the fights breaking out and him ordering security to take people out of his rally because bless God if you don't agree with me and if you don't worship me if you don't fall down at my feet I don't even want you in my in my rally even though there are you know 10,000 other people who do no this guy can't even have one person in the room that isn't adoring him and worshiping him and falling down at his feet. Now that's too many. I get very concerned about what I see. I, I grew up with people. I've got, I've got uncles and aunts. That if you'd asked me ten years ago. If I ever thought for a million dollars. They would fall after this kind of personality. I would have said oh no, no, no. Not at all. But ever since the campaign of 2015, the election of 2016, I've had a wake-up call. And I've been very surprised by some of the things I've seen. And one of the most heartbreaking things that I've ever seen in my life is how the church of Jesus Christ today has now been stuck with such a negative and such a nasty, hateful image and how people in our world are looking at the Christian faith more negatively than they've ever looked at it before. Am I telling the truth? Yes. I said, Lord, I, I, I can't believe some of the things that I've seen. And you know what the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said? He said, well, you shouldn't be surprised. Well, what do you mean we shouldn't be surprised? He said, I told you. I told you this would happen. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily or secretly shall bring in damnable heresies. Ooh, that's pretty strong language, Johnny. That doesn't mean they're going to bring in, you know, things that the Lord isn't just quite thrilled with. That's not what that means. That means they're bringing in things that are so contrary to God that it's not even funny. They're heretical things. They're things that directly contradict the teaching of God's Word, and that is what we're seeing today. I talked about it some weeks ago or months ago, how preachers are calling for Christians to arm themselves, to get ready for civil war, even though the Word of God said, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Even though the Word of God said, as much as lies within you, Follow peace with all men. Isn't that what he says? Even though Jesus told his disciple as the soldiers were coming to round him up and bring him into the judgment hall. And his disciple raised the sword and cut off the soldier's ear. And the Lord said, oh, no, 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 no. Put that thing away. That's not how we play. That's not how we operate. Let me tell you something. You start living by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. Isn't that what Jesus said? But we've got preachers today preaching the exact 
opposite of that. They're literally teaching and instructing God's people to embrace ideologies and thinking that has no basis whatsoever in the Word of God, has no place in the Word of God. Goes on to tell us not only shall they bring in damnable heresies, but even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. You know, it makes me laugh. We've got all these preachers in the world who they just love to preach and talk about Sodom and Gomorrah and how God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And of course, the reasons they give, we know, because we've actually read the Bible, we know the reasons they give are not accurate and not factual and not true. But... Am I saying that the Lord didn't destroy the city? Absolutely, I believe he did. But like I said, uh, he gives us the exact reasoning for why he did so. And I got news for you, it don't line up with what 99% of churches teach today. But they love to preach about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah as though that is the greatest, you know, what they call the sins of Sodom are the greatest sins that any human beings can commit. And yet somehow or another they seem to overlook the fact that Peter tells us in 2 Peter that these false prophets and these false teachers will bring upon themselves swift destruction. I got news for you, honey. God don't take kindly to people who misrepresent Him. Mm -hmm. And for some of you out there today who are not believers, you're not Christians and you're hearing me, I want to tell you a little secret. You're right when you say that Franklin Graham and some of these other preachers don't seem to be acting at all like what you understand Christianity to be. And they're not at all teaching and preaching what you understand Christianity to teach. You're absolutely right when you say that. But I'm here to tell you a little secret today. This book is a whole lot more than some old document that some old man sat down and wrote hundreds or thousands of years ago. This book is as alive as I am. And when you're surprised by the things you see, I want to tell you today, we shouldn't be surprised. We've been forewarned. Peter went on to say, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. The term pernicious that is uh, translated here in the King James pernicious this in the Greek literally means their destructive ways. Many will follow. Many will follow. Not a few. That's one of the things that's really gotten me. Is that it, it, it isn't just a few people who have gone after these false prophets and these false teachers. No, Bill, it's many. It's scary when you look at how many people are following after these false prophets and they're not even beginning to weigh what these men are teaching and what these men are saying against the Word of God. They're not even beginning to weigh it against the Word of God. It's like they say it, it's so, period, end of story. Excuse me, no, no, no. The Word of God said, try every spirit, see whether it be of God or not. Honey, I don't care who's doing the preaching. You better take and check and see what spirit it is that's motivated that preacher. Just because they've got a famous daddy, just because they've been on TV, just because they've been around a long while, does not mean they are operating under the direction and the anointing of the Lord. <coughs> I'm going to tell you, one of the most dangerous things ever happened to Christianity, I've come to realize, is Christian television. Yep. One of the worst things 
to ever hit Christianity is television. Pastor, why do you say that? I'll tell you why. Because television has created this false illusion that those who develop large followings are blessed of God and they're the ones we ought to be listening to. What an idiotic way of thinking. And yet that is exactly how most Christians in the world today think. Right. If you've got a huge following, you must be telling it right. You must be preaching it right. Honey, i got news for you. Again, that is exactly the opposite of what the Word of God said. The Word of God said in the last days, men shall heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. In other words, people will literally elevate preachers and teachers who simply tell them what satisfies their hearing. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a bunch of carnal, ungodly, wicked people who identify themselves as Christians, and honey, not everything in the barn is a cow. You got a bunch of evil people identifying themselves as Christians. It don't take a whole lot. You know, there's an old saying, talk is cheap. Anybody can profess to be a Christian. It takes a real Christian to live this thing. See, you can't fake the real thing. Because the real thing requires that you put effort into living it the way God has ordained it be lived. Mm -hmm. You see, you can't fake that. Oh, but there's a lot of people out there calling themselves Christian. They're no more Christian today than this pulpit. Hmm. But it said, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth, listen, shall be evil spoken of. Tommy, we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised today that Christianity is looked upon in a more negative fashion than it ever has been looked upon in history. We shouldn't be surprised today that people are following after false teachers and false leaders and false preachers and false prophets uh, in enormous numbers. We shouldn't be surprised today that people we have held in high esteem and we've really uh, had a lot of confidence in over the years, we shouldn't be surprised that they're falling in with the crowd and just going along with the program. Why in the world should we be surprised? The Word of God told us that this was coming. See, the problem is too many so-called Christians no more believe this book than anybody. I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I've always been an odd duck. I really have, and I know I've always been an odd duck. I remember as a kid in church, you know, preachers, they, they just love to try to scare the happy hallelujah out of you. You know what I'm talking about. Seemed like every sermon, everything you heard, they were trying to scare the devil out of you in Jesus India. Oh, the Lord may come tonight. Oh, you need to be ready. And if that didn't work, you may leave the house of God tonight and walk out in that street and get hit by a car. And there you'll be stepping into eternity because the preacher thinks his job is to get you down in the altar weeping and wailing and snotting all over everything. I know, I grew up in this thing. I know how it worked. The thing that gets me is <coughs> yeah, that's, I told you my brain's kind of pooping out here a little bit. <laughs> I'm sorry. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom 
the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Now listen. Oh, that's what I was saying. But I knew it would come back to me after a second. I'm sorry. <sighs> I'd listen to these preachers preaching all this, you know, and, and especially when it come to the rapture and the coming of the Lord and how they try to scare the bejesus out of you. Uh, concerning the rapture. And I used to think to myself, but wait a minute, the Lord Himself said certain signs that had to come to pass first. And I was a young man, Johnny, and I'd say, well, no, wait a minute. How are they going to stand there trying to scare people into the altar when the Word of God clearly said there are certain signs that have to come to pass first? Well, you shouldn't be standing there telling people the Lord may come tonight in order to scare them because it ain't so. Jesus Himself said that not one prophecy would go unfulfilled. Isn't that what He said? He said not one prophecy will go unfulfilled. Not one thing is going to fail to happen that I have said is going to happen prior to my return. Not one bit of it is going to fail to happen. So you know what that means, Johnny? That means that he's basically given us kind of a, uh, a farmer's almanac, you know? And that farmer's almanac can give you an idea of what the weather's going to be like months from now. That, al that almanac can tell you way in advance what the weather's going to look like on a certain day in the future, doesn't it? think, how in the world? Well, because they take into account, you know, the, the Gulf Stream, and they take into account the uh, way that the air moves, and they take into account uh, the temperatures at that time of year, and how it causes condensation, and all these other scientific factors, and they're able to put together a pretty stinking accurate outlook. The Lord's given us an almanac. He said, listen, all you got to do is read this and I'll tell you what's happening. I'll tell you what's coming. You shouldn't be surprised by what's going to happen because I'm telling you in advance what is coming. And if you add what I'm telling you, Jesus said, and you look to the sky, then you can tell by the look of the sky what the weather's going to be. You ever gone outside in the morning and looked up in the sky and thought, oh man, those clouds look kind of dark and ominous. I might ought to get myself a raincoat. I might ought to get myself a jacket because it's going to rain. Now it's not raining right then, but you know it's going to rain for too long, don't you? Why? Because you can tell by the sky. This is what Jesus said concerning the rapture. He said, listen, you'll be able to tell that it's coming nearer and nearer. You'll be able to see the signs will be there. You'll be able to detect just like you can look up into the sky and you can read the clouds and you can read the sky. But we've got churches that for many, many years have literally used the coming of the Lord as a tool to scare people out of their mind. This is, this is a sad state of affairs, folks. God's people ought to look to the coming of the Lord with great excitement and great anticipation. There shouldn't be a thing in the world about the Lord coming that scares you. And there shouldn't be a preacher on the planet that preaches it with that intent. Amen. The Word of God continues and says, And through covetousness. That means they want something. Shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you? I've told you before, what does he mean, make merchandise of you? Well, it's very simple. If I offer my congregation to a politician and I say, for a price I can deliver their votes, I've just made merchandise of you. 
if these big TV preachers can tell politicians, hey, you know what, for a price, I can deliver these people's votes for you. They've made merchandise of you. Uh -huh. You are for sale. Mm -hmm. You are to them a product. They don't have to get money out of the deal. If they want some form of political influence, if they want some kind of political favor, that is still selling you for a price. Am I telling the truth? Yes. I'll tell you a little secret, honey. Politics and faith don't mix. Especially if that faith is Christianity. It was a mixture of religion and politics that crucified Jesus. That's true. Mm -hmm. See, the Jews wanted him dead for religious reasons. They didn't have anything on him politically. But when their Roman... colonizers wouldn't prosecute him on the premise of their religious reasons and their relig then all of a sudden they turn to political political talk well hey we have no king but Caesar are you trying to suggest that this man is our king oh you don't want to do that you'll make Caesar very angry all of a sudden oh Pilate, Herod, I should say, uh, Pilate took a very different thought on the matter, didn't he? Amen. Because all of a sudden it was brought into the political arena. I'm going to tell you the Roman Catholic Church has been mingling politics and religion for centuries. What we're seeing in evangelical churches today is we are seeing the younger sister following in the older sister's behavioral pattern. We're seeing the evangelical churches in America today trying to walk like Catholicism. We'll deliver you the people. They're merchandise to us. We'll deliver them to you. We'll deliver their vote to you. All we want is political power. All we want is political influence. All we want is certain laws to be put into effect. But listen again, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Again, what is Peter saying? He's saying, uh, these people who misrepresent God, these people who play games with God, uh, God don't play with that. They won't last very long. That's why I've tried to tell you today, I said, what we're going through right now, I don't know the length of time that we're going to have to endure it, but I guarantee you it'll come to a crashing close before too long. Even Hitler's so-called thousand-year reign of the Third Reich came to a quick conclusion, didn't it? He couldn't even go a few decades before that all came to a crashing halt. Well, I've got news for you today, folks. God does not take kindly. He does not take lightly people who misrepresent him. In Matthew 24, 11 through 13, the word of the Lord declares, And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. We shouldn't be surprised. The Word of God told us this was going to happen. Philippians 3, 17 through 19. Join together, Paul writes the church at Philippi. Join together. This is, by the way, the NIV for a little bit clearer understanding. 
said, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. He's talking about the church, folks. He's talking about Christians. Paul is talking. He's saying, no, no, listen. You need to follow the example you've seen me set. You need to follow the example that you've seen me live. Because not everybody that calls themselves a Christian is living the way they ought to be living. Said, so as a matter of fact, right. many of them live as enemies of the cross of Christ. And then listen, remember I told you, God don't take lightly to those who misrepresent Him. Once again, listen to what Paul said. Their destiny is destruction. See, every single time you start talking about people who aren't doing this thing right and aren't representing the Lord right, it winds up in a bad place. He said their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Now listen, this is an important thing to understand today. Their mind is set on earthly things. Why do we have so many false prophets and so many false teachers leading so many people astray today? It's very, very simple. Very simple. The answer is so simple it will blow your mind. Because their minds are set on earthly things. They're not thinking right. Yep. They're not paying attention to the things they ought to be paying attention to. They're not focusing on things which are above. Isn't that what the Word of God tells us to do? We're to focus on things which are above. But their mind is set on earthly things. These are worldly people. Johnny, these are carnal people. These are people who are not even remotely thinking like Christians are supposed to think. They're not even remotely behaving like Christians are supposed to behave because they're not looking at things the way Christians are supposed to look at things. In Jude, the writer Jude writes, verses 17 through 19, the whole book is one chapter. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts or their own ungodly desires. These be they who separate themselves, meaning elevate themselves. They actually consider themselves to be better than you and I. Oh yeah, don't you, if you don't think Franklin Graham thinks he's better than you and me, you haven't read too much of what he's had to say, have you? If you don't think these TV preachers with millions of followers on television and millions of dollars coming in through the mail, if you don't think they think they're better than you and me, uh, no, they've separated themselves. They've elevated themselves. Uh, they believe their own press, which is a very dangerous thing to do. But Jude goes on to say they're sensual. That means carnal. Means worldly. Listen to this last phrase. Having not the Spirit. If you're not a Christian today and you're listening to me, I know I'm probably boring the fire out of you because I'm about dragging, trying to get this out this afternoon and I apologize for that. 
And I want to tell you a little secret, folks. The biggest names in so-called Christianity today are no more Christian than this table right here. The biggest names in Christian television today are no more preaching and teaching the truth of Christ. No, the apostles told us that they're actually living as enemies of the cross of Christ. Oh, but at the same time, they're claiming to be part of the family of faith. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? But Jude said, they are those who separate themselves. They follow after their own ungodly lusts. They are sensual, meaning carnal, worldly, having not the Spirit. Romans 8, 5 through 8, here's what Paul says about having the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You know, <laughs> I watch these fundamentalists and evangelicals and they love to terrorize their followers. They love to terrorize the people in their pews. They terrorize them with, oh, what's going on in our culture today? What's going on in our country today? Oh, we're going to pay the price. We're going to be persecuted. We're this, we're that. Um, you know how I know you're not very spiritual? Do you know how I know you're carnal? Do you know how I know you're in the flesh? Because to be spiritually minded, listen to me now, is life and peace. If you keep your mind, the Word of God said, Thou shalt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. If that preacher in your pulpit were preaching what he ought to be preaching, you'd have no fear. The Word of God tells us, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. But you know how you know what they're preaching is carnal? You know how you know what they're preaching is worldly? You know how you know that what they're preaching is of the flesh and not at all of the spirit? Because it inspires anxiety and it inspires fear. Oh, I'm going to tell you, if you keep your mind on, or on heavenly things, if you keep your mind focused on Him, if you keep your mind focused on the things that God would have us keep our mind focused on, then you know what? We have peace at all times. I've said before, uh, you know, I'm going through stuff in my body right now. I'd rather not have to go through it if I had a choice. Even the Lord prayed, not my will, but thine be done, if, if this cup could pass from me. Yeah, I'd say, Lord, if this cup could pass from me, I'd be happy for it to do so. I'd really rather not have to drink from it if I didn't have to. But you know what? Whatever comes, it comes. I'm ready to go. I'm looking for heaven. I haven't got a concern in the world. Uh, you don't have to believe in heaven. You don't have to believe there's going to be a glad reunion day. You don't have to believe that God is real. You don't have to believe that heaven's waiting and hell's hot. It don't matter to me. I believe it and I'm looking forward to it. So death doesn't scare me. I've stood on the precipice. I've been literally on the edge, Johnny. I was right there. All I had to do was surrender to it, and I would have been in eternity. And I'm going to tell you a little secret. It was the best feeling I've ever had in my life. I've never felt anything like it. And if you think for one minute that I'm not looking forward to feeling it again, you are wrong. When I lay in that hospital bed in 2000 and and the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, Do you want to come home or do you want to stay? 
And I was so sick and tired and down to 135 pounds and just, I can't even describe how tired I was. I said, Lord, I, I just want to go home. And immediately, upon thinking that thought, because I was intubated so I couldn't speak, but immediately upon thinking that, I literally begin to feel my spirit separate from my body. Oh, there's people out there going to tell you, oh, well, that's just this uh, chemical effect, and that's just this happening, and that's just that happening. Well, that's funny because all of a sudden I remembered the few men that we had in our little affirming church there in New Haven, Connecticut. And I said, oh, Lord, wait, I can't go. I can't go. Those men will have no pastor. There's nobody waiting to do the job I'm doing. If I leave, then, then these men are going to be stuck. And then all of a sudden I literally felt my spirit drop back into my body literally like a ton of bricks. Well, I guess somehow or another I released some endorphins, you know, that turned things around and created this sensation. But when I was feeling that release from my body, I never felt so free in my life. I, I can't even describe the feeling. It was the most wonderful sensation, Johnny, I've ever had in my life. It was amazing. I, I, I sat there and I said, my God... I didn't have a fear, I didn't have a concern, I didn't have a worry, I didn't have any negative, nothing negative, nothing negative. I didn't feel anything negative. E everything I felt was positive and good. And then when I remembered those men, I said, oh God, I can't go. And I felt my spirit literally drop, drop back into my body. And it was like, boom, literally. And then all of a sudden, Johnny, I'm laying there in the hospital, and I went to lift my hand, and I remember saying, my God, how long has my arm weighed that much? Because <laughs> when my spirit wasn't in my body, I felt weightless. You know, I didn't feel any weight at all. All of a sudden, I went to lift my arm. I said, holy mackerel. When you put this old suit armor on, you realize how much it weighs. I'll tell you something, I'm not afraid of death. There isn't a thing in the world that would cause me fear or anxiety. Because thou shalt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. God has not given us the spirit of fear. What a pitiful thing that churches today trade in fear and anxiety. But those that do are not preaching the truth of God's word. They're preaching a carnal message. Because to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse 7, Romans 8, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now listen to verse 9. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you call yourself a Christian today and you're going to a church where the preacher scares the life out of you, with all these threats of what's happening in our culture and what's happening in our country and what's happening in our government. And oh dear God, you better do this and you better do that because all this is going on and we need to affect change in the world in which we live. I got news for you, honey. They're not preaching the Christian message. You're in the wrong church. And they no way in the world you're going to learn how to please God in that church because they that are in the flesh cannot please God. <clears throat> it's impossible to please God and to walk in the flesh. It's impossible. <sighs> I've seen things the last few years that have bothered me, troubled me, shocked me, 
surprised me. But the Spirit of the Lord says, you shouldn't be surprised. I told you. I told you this was coming. And we are literally seeing, folks, exactly what the Word of God said. The difference is, growing up as a kid in church, it always felt like they were talking about stuff that was a hundred years away. You know, stuff that was off in the distance. Mm -hmm. Well, now we are living in the fruition. Now we're living in the happening. Now we're seeing it occur as it's been foretold. Am I telling the truth today? Yes, you are. And therefore, we needn't be surprised. All we need be is prepared. Amen. I've been preaching for months now, and I'm closing up right now. I'll be done in a minute, I promise. Johnny, don't you crack a grin. I'm too tired. <coughs> I've been preaching for a long time now, hadn't I? I said, folks, we need to keep our mind on heavenly things. We need to keep our mind on doing things God's way. We need to keep our mind on living this thing the way it's supposed to be lived. We can't even let all the crapola that's going on in the world right around us right now, we can't even let that affect us in the sense that we begin to seek out carnal responses to the things that are happening. God gives us prophecy so we can prepare in advance. That's why the word of the Lord uh, came to the prophet and said, Hey, famine's coming. You better store up food. So making preparations in advance for things that are coming, there, there ain't nothing unscriptural about that because God gives warning of things in advance that are coming. But as far as running around like a chicken with our head chopped off, trying to figure out how we're going to respond to what's happening in our world today, no, no, I'm not surprised by what I see. I'm not surprised by what I was, <laughs> but I've, I've stopped being surprised. The Word of God told us, and the Word of God is reliable. The Word of God is true. We are seeing it happen even as it was said it would happen. We simply shouldn't be surprised. Would you stand with me today?